Okay, welcome to uh, the sessions on oceans and change, oceans and global change. Everybody can come in and take a seat uh, and we'll get started. They'll be down there, and then you, so they can see. So. <laughs> but you can sit up here for now. Okay. Uh, I'll, you'll be first. Yeah, I'll let you. Yeah. Okay. So raise your hand if you live near the coast. All right. There's a good good handful of you. About 40 percent of Americans and 40 percent of the world's population live uh, within close distance to our coastlines. Yes, sure, why not, yes. <laughs> and so the oceans play an important role in, uh, in human societies and human life. Um, and uh, it's not only that, but they also play an, uh, important roles in our global climate and our global, global carbon cycle. And so for example, about, um, about uh, two percent of the carbon is, or the atmosphere contains about two percent of the carbon that's in uh, between the uh, that's in the ocean, and so the ocean is a huge reservoir. Over 90 per, 98 percent um, of uh, the carbon in those two reservoirs, so huge holds a huge amount. It is also a huge amount of heat, and so about ninety percent of the heat is um, that the oceans are taking up or that the earth is taking up due to global warming is happening in the oceans. And so the subject of this, uh, of this talk is, is very, of, these, uh, of this session is really looks at these, these issues. And we've got a few uh, experts here uh, that are uh, gonna give us a short 12-minute uh, presentations and then uh, on their respective subjects and their, their work. And then we're going to open it up afterwards to questions from the audience. And we'll do it the same way that we've been doing um, before. We'll hold the questions to the end. But if you have a question throughout, write it down on your note card and hold it up in the air. And some of our helpers will come around, gather those questions, and then uh, I can ask the question uh, of the speakers all together at the very end. Our uh, if you need more note cards, you can pick them up from um, uh, yeah, the young lady in the back uh, right there. Uh, just raise your hand and you can pick them up. Okay, so our first speaker is Anand Gadandesikin, and he's from Johns Hopkins University. He's a, an oceanographer, uh, primarily a physical oceanographer, looking at how the ocean and uh, climate system works. He's, a, uh, he's an editor on the Journal of Climate, and he... Um, uh, he's um, working on issues of, that range from ocean uh, and climate change into uh, the chemistry and the biogeochemical biology impacts uh, and, uh, and physical impacts that are going on in the ocean. And so he's going to talk to us about sort of the scientific uh, outlook on the oceans in a high CO2 world. So welcome, Anand. Thanks, Andrew. Make sure you can all hear me. Okay, so I wanted to start off today by talking about some of the fundamental physics and, and chemistry that underlie climate change and its impacts on the oceans. Um, so I'm going to just ask a quick question to the audience. How do you know when water on the stove is getting hot? Presumably not by boiling your finger, as the gentleman in the front row suggests. What happens? You see bubbles, right? So when water gets hot, you see bubbles coming out of the water. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the fact that you have dissolved gas in the water and that it comes out of solution. And for water, this means that at, in the current world, about 240 grams or micrograms of carbon is dissolved in each kilogram of water. That doesn't sound like a lot. But as Andrew just pointed out, that's 38,000 billion tons of carbon in the ocean versus about 800 in the atmosphere. So most of the carbon in the ocean atmosphere system is actually in the ocean. Now why is that? Now most of that is actually not in this form of dissolved, dissolved gas, and we'll talk a little bit about why. So I want you to 
imagine that you're a molecule sitting, you have a molecule's eye view of the ocean air interface. And if you did, what you would see is molecules flying in from above and molecules leaving from below, what it would look like a constant exchange of parcels, particles coming from the water and leaving to the air and molecules coming from the air and entering the water. Now, in order for a molecule to be part of a liquid, it can't have a lot of energy. And so what this means is that as the temperatures get higher and higher and higher, it's going to be easier for those gas molecules to leave the water and enter the air, and it's going to be harder for them to leave the air and enter the water. And one of the consequences of this is that for basically all the gases we know about, as the temperature increases, the solubility of those gases goes down. That's true for carbon dioxide, it's true for oxygen. However, the more molecules that are hitting the, the water from above, the more are going to enter it. And so at higher concentrations in the atmosphere, more gas molecules enter the water of that particular gas and the carbon goes up. Carbon dioxide has risen about 40% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And this means that that 240 micrograms is about 40% higher than it was before the Industrial Revolution. So I want to talk a little bit about the implications of that for two types of climate change that are related to anthropogenic man-made climate change. The first is oxygen and natural dead zones. So what you see on the screen in front of you on the, the left-hand side is a plot of the oxygen concentration at 300 meters in the ocean. And the bluish colors there, the first three colors, are for very low concentrations of oxygen. These, you've, many of you have heard of dead zones. The Chesapeake Bay has one. There's one off of the uh, Louisiana coast that are caused by nutrient runoff. These are the real big dead zones of the ocean. About 10% of the ocean has oxygen in a concentration so low that it can't support oxygen breathing life. It can't support fish that use gills to get their oxygen. It's 10% of the ocean volume. These are natural. They, have been there, they, they arise because it's simply very difficult for waters from the surface to make their way to these locations. We understand the physics behind that reasonably well. But that's 10% of the ocean. What happens under climate change? This is from a paper that I published a few years ago where we looked at this question. And what you see, I want you to direct your attention first to the upper left here, showing the change in oxygen the black line shows the, the fractional change in oxygen as we move forward with warming, and you can see it drops. It drops over the course of this 300-year simulation by about 9%, which is a reasonably large fraction. Um, the red line is the volume of the regions where oxygen is too low to support tuna, sharks, macroscopic uh, life forms. That rises by about 19%. So there's a significant increase. The upper right-hand column shows the uh, upper right panel shows the change in oxygen concentration. And you can see that it's increasing in general around the edges of, of the subtropical gyres, the, the, the great whorls of, of water that fill the middle latitudes. So these regions that here are low in oxygen the blue regions tend to expand inward. And that's about, that, that changes the volume available by about 10%. Now this is from the, the model that I used to work on at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab. A recent paper by Matt Long, Curtis Deutsch, and Taki Ito, just came out a few weeks ago, is, is, is shown on the lower right. And you can see that these are very consistent, or relatively consistent in many regions, particularly the North Pacific. So that oxygen is going down as as climate warms. Now this gives you some losers. And this is an example of some pretty serious losers. Uh, these are crabs that were killed by uh, low oxygen off the Oregon coast. So as these low oxygen water upwells onto coastal regions, it kills things that breathe air. Um, and so this is a, an increasing problem, likely to become more so in future years. However, it turns out that there's not only losers, there's potential winners as well. If you actually look at where we catch tuna, every tuna in the North Pacific, when it's caught, is actually tagged. And the trap is, every time there's a trap set, 
that location is recorded, and so the Inter-American Tuna, Inter, yes, Inter Tuna Commission keeps track of where every net has been set for the last 50 years. If you look at that region, it's right on top of the low oxygen zone. Tuna like low oxygen waters, possibly because sharks don't, can't come up and get them from below. And so that region is expanding. Um, that's potentially good for certain fish that like to live above low oxygen waters, and some of them are fish we care about. So deoxygenation is one of these problems that people don't talk about when they talk about climate change, but there is some evidence that we may be observing it already. I want to move on to carbon. So this shows the uptake of carbon by the ocean in a model calculation um, with a bunch of different models that I've run in my group. And there's some uncertainty there that has to do with ocean physics. That's not important for the purposes of this talk. But I want you to see that the values are ranging between half a gigaton and two and a half gigatons of carbon a year. We put in about eight to nine gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere. So roughly 25 to 30 percent of modern emissions is going into the ocean. A significant fraction of that in the upper right-hand column, a panel, goes into the southern ocean, the region south of 30 degrees south, which is a challenge to us because it's really difficult to make measurements down there. Now, this has an impact on carbon chemistry, and I just want to run you through the carbon chemistry. This is, in many ways, a setup to Ryan's talk. So if we take carbon dioxide, which I've shown here is this molecule with a black carbon in the middle and uh, red oxygens on the outside, and water, they combine to form carbonic acid. Now, an acid is a chemical that, when put in water, can lose, sometimes lose a hydrogen ion. So that's what happens here. It's a lot, the carbonic acid loses its hydrogen ion. It becomes a bicarbonate ion. Bicarbonate is baking soda, right? It's what you take to settle your tummy. And it can lose yet another one to become a carbonate ion. And carbonate ions are important because they form part of calcium carbonate, which is chalk. It's the, the material that makes up the shells of many marine organisms. So what happens when we put more carbon in the ocean? Well, first of all, we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's obviously lots of water in the ocean. That carbon dioxide combines with water in the ocean to form carbonic acid, which increases the carbonic acid concentration. That is increased by about 40% since pre-industrial times. That, then, that carbonic acid then dissociates, but the hydrogen ion that's left over gets picked up by the carbonate ion, which also turns into a bicarbonate ion. And so the result is that carbonic acid and bicarbonate increase, but carbonate ion decreases. When we talk about ocean acidification, this is often what we're really talking about. It's not a change, so much the change in the pH of the ocean, although it may be for some organisms, but it's the decrease in carbonate ion. And so this is a real worry for us because, and this is from a paper that we published about 11 years ago. I was one of a cast of thousands on it. Um, showing the top line shows all of these potential scenarios for how carbon dioxide might increase in the atmosphere in the future. And the bottom line, the bottom part of the panel, shows all of the potential scenarios corresponding to those of how the calcium carbonate concentration would decrease. And you can see that it decreases over the course of the century substantially. And the key is when it drops below that dotted line. That dotted line is the saturation point for a particular kind of chalky shell. When the calcium carbonate drops below that level, those shells start to dissolve. Now there's some positive things to this. Higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, high, d dissolving shells is bad for living organisms, but it means that, that sediments on the bottom will also dissolve. And this is how we are dealing with the carbon problem now. It is not the case that the world has no strategy for dealing with carbon dioxide. We dump it in the ocean and we let the sediments take care of it. That is what we are doing. And this, is what, what, this shows what would happen to sediments in the Atlantic in, a, in, a, in one model. Um, at various depths, 4,500 meters, 5,000 meters, and 5,500 meters, if we were to add carbon dioxide to the ocean over 5,000 years, over the three to four shows between 1,000 and 10,000 years, the sediments get eroded away, the carbon dioxide is neutralized, no problem. 
The problem with this is not that carbon dioxide is not going to be taken care of. It's that it's going to take a long time to take care of it. The problem is not carbon dioxide per se. The Earth has figured out how to deal with carbon dioxide. The problem is that this mechanism takes thousands of years to operate. Okay, I'll come back to that later. And we have some evidence that this has negative impacts on a number of calcifying organisms. The upper left shows Limacina, which is a, a pteropod. It's one of the dominant uh, um, plankton species in the, the North Pacific. Um, and if you expose Limacina to high levels of CO2, the, the electron micrograph on the lower left shows what happens in a healthy shell, which is the, the lower right portion. You get this nice mother of pearl conditions. In all of the other, condi the, the other cases, the, it's been exposed to high levels of CO2 and it starts to dissolve, it starts to flake. And we expect to see major impacts in the North Pacific in the next 20, 30 years on Limacina. Corals also are very sensitive to the level of carbonate ion in the ocean and, and as they get warmer, as the ocean gets warmer and carbon, carbonate concentration gets lower, we expect corals to calcify less. Um, the lower right shows places where that's happening now. The, the red um, points are we're coming out of an El Nino, so it's not terribly bad this week, but we've seen a huge bleaching event in the last two years. If you know a coral reef biologist, be nice to them because they're really depressed. Now, there are some surprises here as well, though. This is a paper that we published last uh, December in Science. The lower left shows some measurements that were made in the North Atlantic over the last 50 years of, of a particular kind of plankton. These are made by dragging a machine that looks kind of like a pasta machine behind a, uh, an ocean-going vessel. That pasta machine actually has two rolls of silk that filter the water and deposit it on a roll. It's called the Continuous Plankton Recorder. It's been run out of Plymouth for the last 50 years. The gray lines in the, the lower left panel here show the number of measurements that were made. So we have a few thousand measurements a year. Um, the green line shows the fraction of those measurements that contain this uh, phytoplankton in the upper right, coccolithophores, which are calcium-shelled organisms. They've increased 20-fold in the North Atlantic over the last 50 years. We think that this is, this is a huge surprise to us. This was, the reason we got into science for this is that everyone was expecting this to go the other way and for the effect to be small. Um, it appears that these organisms actually like to, are actually limited by carbon dioxide, that the reason that they calcify may be they make these calcium shells in order to get enough carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis. So you give them more carbon dioxide, they're actually happier. This is not something that anybody predicted. So I want to leave you with that with a couple of implications. First is that humans have the potential and are in fact in the process of making large impacts on ocean chemistry. But they're likely to be both winners and losers from this, these changes. And this is one reason why a fee and benefit type strategy is important, right? Because if you are benefiting from increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you ha have the ability to afford to pay a fee. If you are not benefiting, you get the benefits. There is some way of compensating you. Okay, fee and benefits deal with that problem of how you connect winners and losers. And the second point I want to make is that over long periods of time, chemical feedbacks involved with changing the ocean chemistry are going to act to stabilize the system, but it's going to take a long time. However, over short periods of time, we are seeing large ecological changes. Ecology tends to respond fast, chemistry tends to respond slow. And this is one of the big problems that we face. And so, one of the things that I think is important when we talk about this is that we are not just talking about stopping global warming, we're talking about slowing the rate of change. Slowing the rate of change is something that people across the political spectrum can get behind. For conservatives, the idea that change is necessarily good is not obvious. And one of the key things that we need to think about when we think about um, making these arguments is how we slow the rate of change because that's what is going to enable the system to respond in ways that are more resilient and potentially more sustainable. 
So I'd like to thank you for listening and thank the organizers for inviting me. All right, thank you, Anand. <clears throat> Ingrid, do you want to come up? And <clears throat> Our next speaker is Ingrid Beardron, and uh, she comes to us from Oceana. And uh, the, um, she's going to speak to us about um, uh, acoustics offshore and, uh, and the impacts of um, uh, acoustic testing on uh, our marine mammal populations and seismic air gun stuff. Uh, and so uh, Ingrid has a background in, um, in mammal, marine mammal acoustics, fisheries, um, and ecosystem management. And, um, and now she works at Oceana. And so I'll hand it over to her. How's that? Is that okay? Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for being here today to listen um, to us talk about oceans and climate. Um, and I'd also like to thank one of my coworkers, Una Watkins, who helped with this presentation. Um, Oceana, just to give you some background, is the largest international ocean NGO in the world, and we protect and restore the world's oceans um, using science. Can you speak a little louder? Sure. How's that? I think there's a... How's that? No I'll just hold this. <laughs> okay. Today I'll be talking about oil and gas exploration, um, specifically off the Atlantic coast, but you can think of a lot of the lessons I talk about um, being applied worldwide. And I'll be talking about air gun surveying, offshore drilling, um, and the impacts of these activities on marine life. And then finally, I'll talk about a few things you can do if you're interested in making a difference in this area. So why do we even care about this topic of seismic air gun blasting? And I'll explain what it is in just a couple slides. Um, we care because right now President Obama and uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is considering permits for seismic air gun blasting off the coast of the Atlantic. And even though the Atlantic has been taken out of the five-year plan for the next five years for offshore drilling, um, permits for seismic exploration are still being considered. And those permits are being reviewed right now and could be approved with boats in the water as early as this summer or fall. And there's a long, complicated process involved in that, which we don't need to go into here. The area um, being considered right now in the Atlantic falls between Delaware and Florida. So the area is shown in red here. And there are a lot of important marine animal habitats within the, that zone. So what is air gun blasting or seismic air gun blasting? Will we use it? Sure. OK, I'll try to talk louder. We use seismic air gun blasting to explore where oil and gas deposits are underneath the sea floor. And to do this, um, ships tow these air gun arrays behind them. And these air guns shoot loud, explosive blasts of bubbles and air into the, into the water. And then echoes go all the way down through the water column and below the sea floor. And then they bounce back up to the surface. And, and scientists can use those um, recordings to understand, about, to understand what type of oil and gas are below the ocean floor. And here's a picture of a ship towing a seismic array. Um, these Arrays can be um, anywhere from 12 air guns to 96 air guns, and I'm going to try to play you an example of one now. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but it's a really loud, explosive sound um, that's been compared to dynamite exploding underwater. And these air guns, when, an, when a survey is happening, the ships are going back and forth across huge areas of the ocean, um, sending out these explosions every 10 to 12 seconds for days, weeks, even months at a time. 
And these sounds are loud enough to travel six miles beneath the seafloor, so they're really loud. They can be heard up to 2,500 miles away, which is the distance between New York City and LA. And here's a picture of um, one single air gun there on the lower right, and then an array of air guns um, on the top. And some of these arrays can be three and a half times the size of Central Park. So I think you've gotten an idea of the fact these, these air gun arrays that are towed by ships are huge and they create enormous amounts of noise that are um, subject animals to um, a disruption in, the, in their marine habitats. And sound in the oceans is important, and the reason we're worried about sound is because lots of animals use sound to survive. Um, scientific studies show that whales, fish, turtles, and invertebrates all use sound to communicate. And they use this communication for things like navigation, finding mates, finding food, and keeping track of their young. And air guns are one of the loudest human-made sounds in the oceans today. Um, other sources of noise include shipping, um, military activities, and construction. Uh, this map shows areas that are important habitat for marine life in the Atlantic where the seismic air gun testing is proposed. And the gray, the area outlined in gray here, those are the areas where seismic air gun blasting would happen if the permits were approved. And then the colorful areas are areas that have been deemed important habitat for commercial and recreational fish, uh, the North Atlantic right whale, which is an extremely endangered whale, and loggerhead sea turtles, which are also endangered. Um, this map shows um, the only known calving ground for the North Atlantic right whale. So that's just one example of one species um, that would be impacted by seismic air gun blasting in this area. And there are only about 500 right whales left, and as I said, this is their only known calving ground, so we're really concerned about seismic happening there. Um, as I said, only about 500 right whales exist, and here I'll play you a sound, one of the sounds they make. Can you hear that? probably can't really hear it. No, it's not going to work. That's okay. They sound, well, they make sounds. You can listen to them after if you're interested. Um, and uh, there have been scientific studies done that show that um, in response to seismic noise, um, whales leave their habitat. Um, behaviors like mating and finding food are interrupted. Uh, their communications can be masked or drowned out. Uh, they cause, uh, there's, they can get stressed, um, their hearing structures can be damaged, and um, their physio physiology can be changed. And there are lots of examples of individual species um, changing their behavior as well. So um, overall, we just know seismic air gun noise um, harms whales and endangered whales in, in ways that could um, decrease their population sizes. Studies also show that seismic air gun noise uh, negatively impacts commercial and recreationally important fish. Um, one study showed that um, catch rates of commercially important species, commercially important species declined 40 to 80 percent. Um, also, um, cod and pollock, which are important species uh, in New England, um, their hearing structures are actually damaged and they were scared away from the seismic air guns. And there's also been damage to pink snapper, another important commercial species. And even invertebrates are impacted by seismic air gun noise. Um, squid have been shown to be startled and scared away by seismic um, crabs and bivalves, such as oysters and mussels. Um, uh, their development is affected. And uh, scallops also have um, malformations and developmental delays when exposed to seismic air gun noise. Um, the Atlantic is home to the loggerhead sea turtle, which is an endangered sea turtle species. And turtles also use noise um, to survive, and studies have shown that they um, have alarm responses or swim away from seismic air gun noise, avoid habitats where there's seismic happening, um, and can even be entangled in some of the seismic survey equipment. And 
the connection between seismic and climate, and why you're all here today, is that seismic air gun blasting is the first step to offshore drilling for oil. And um, the reason the companies, the oil companies are interested in seismic is because that, that's the activity that shows them where, where oil deposits are and where they can drill to find them. And just to give you a quick um, synopsis on offshore drilling and what it entails, um, the first step is an oil rig is built in the ocean. Um, and then these, these uh, rigs can uh, dig wells into the ocean floor where oil and gas is extracted from. And then finally, the oil and gas is used by all of us for um, use in cars and machines and ultimately releasing greenhouse gases into the environment. And as we all know, uh, the, some of the dangers of offshore drilling from um, oil spills that have happened in the past and most recently um, from the BP oil spill. Um, here's just some examples of how marine life can be impacted from those spills. And Oceana, um, we support um, a transition from um, offshore energy or oil exploration and drilling to more renewable resources such as offshore wind. I'm oh, sorry, not quite done yet. <laughs> Almost there. <laughs> oh, but, oh, thanks for clapping for wind, yes. Um, so we are hoping that that's something that continues to expand. Um, so what can you do? What can you do if you're interested in, um, you know, halting this, this seismic air gun um, testing and offshore drilling for oil. Um, at Oceana, we've been working with um, organizations, with, with citizens, with businesses, with town councils, with politicians, all up and down the East Coast. And all of these stars represent cities or towns where there's been a resolution for um, a ban on offshore drilling and or seismic air gun blasting. We have over 110 towns and cities where councils have passed these resolutions. And um, scientists in the, in the marine science community also have written letters to President Obama asking him not to approve seismic in the Atlantic and not to expand offshore drilling. And what you can do is, um, I know a lot, many of you are going to the Hill tomorrow to talk with representatives. And um, one thing that we've been encouraging stakeholders to do is to tell the administration, tell representatives, if you don't want these seismic air gun permits, approved for the Atlantic. Um, they haven't been approved yet, but they could be approved this summer. Um, also on, on Oceana's website, we give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to pass a resolution in your own town against offshore um, drilling and or seismic blasting, and also how to write letters to your editor. And so if you're curious or want to know more about this issue, um, you can go to our website. And thank you, and um, thank you for your time and for having me today. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, and just a reminder, if you have questions, you can be writing them down on your note cards. And uh, uh, if you need more, raise your hands. They've got some back in the back. Uh, and then they'll, we'll come and pick those up, and uh, we can ask the, the panel uh, after this. All right, our final speaker is Ryan Ono. He's coming to us from uh, the Ocean Conservancy. And he's um, he, where he works as the program director for the program on uh, ocean acidification that they have. And he has a master's degree in, um, uh, oh, I forgot now, in marine policy, yeah, exactly, from the University of Delaware. And so he's going to talk to us about uh, ocean acidification problem and what it means for, uh, for our oceans. Great, thanks. Thank you. Volume okay? Good? Thumbs up in the back? All right. Um, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I will be talking to you about ocean acidification. Um, I, and thank you, Anand, for the setup. He, he went over much of the chemistry, so I'll be able to go through those slides a little bit quicker than I thought I would. Um, but a little bit of background. So as um, Andrew mentioned, I work with Ocean Conservancy. We are an ocean advocacy organization based here in Washington, D.C., um, where I work with the Ocean Civication Program, and we work to push state and federal lawmakers to do something about acidification, um, namely through policy, but also through other methods, too. So 
I'd like to talk a little bit about just what I'd like to cover here, um, and also to give you folks a little bit of a flavor of how we talk to lawmakers, whether they be in Congress or in state legislators. So I'll be throwing in little um, notes of how we talk about this issue. And so one of the ways, first off, is just we define the issue. We talk about how ocean acidification is a change in chemistry. Um, even though this is a climate change conference and lobby day, uh, we like to talk about acidification as its own issue because it doesn't change the world's climate. It, talks, it changes the world's chemistry in that it uh, makes it a little bit more acidic. It's a, the process is a, well, it's ocean acidification. It's a process that doesn't make the ocean actually become an acid, which is a um, little bit of a source of confusion. Another thing we like to point out when talking with lawmakers is that it's here now in the United States, uh, particularly in the Pacific Northwest region. I'll be getting into that a little bit more. And then also there's still plenty of time to do something about it, whether you are in Congress or you are just um, advocate, an advocate for it. So as a non-mentioned, um, ocean acidification is a result of carbon dioxide pollution. About 70% of that goes into the atmosphere and that's what drives climate change, but 30% of it is absorbed by the ocean. And that's obviously caused by oil and gas, coal industries, also deforestation is a, a big cause of the, of the carbon dioxide. And so what happens when the CO2 goes into the ocean? I won't go into this a little bit because as I said, um, it was already covered. But essentially what it does is it removes the building blocks calcifying organisms need to survive and to build their, their skeletons if they're corals or build their shells if they're clams, mussels, or oysters. Um, essentially without these um, carbonate ions, they need to spend more energy trying to find them and grow and develop so they have less energy for um, reproduction, for eating, for fighting off diseases. And so because of that, they tend to die off um, sooner than they otherwise would. Here is a, a picture of some oyster larvae or baby oysters. Um, on the left-hand side is what, under a microscope, what an oyster larvae would look like grown under normal conditions. Right-hand side, under ocean acidification conditions, and as I said, Without those um, carbonate ions, they can't build their shells as robustly as they normally would. Um, and so, as I said earlier, they don't survive as, as much. And, oops, sorry, wrong way. And so this actually, this came to the attention of oyster hatcheries in around 2006 in the Pacific Northwest. These oyster hatcheries build their business on selling oyster larvae or oyster larvae or oyster seed to oyster farmers. And as you would guess, um, without oyster seed, oyster farmers don't have a crop. Without a crop, they don't have a livelihood. And so this started to really get the attention of um, the whole industry when these hatcheries started to lose their larvae. They just started dying off mysteriously. Nobody knew why. And so with an industry of this size, with, with many millions of dollars, with thousands of jobs on the line, the hatchery managers actually started to really um, get concerned and started to partner with federal and university scientists. And this is one of just. To back up for a moment, this is um, a story that we like to tell lawmakers all the time. It's one of the tactics we use when we try to emphasize why ocean acidification is an important issue. Yes, the numbers are important, but we also like to provide this narrative in that there is this mysterious die off, people's jobs and, and um, coastal communities and economies were on the line. So what do they do about it? Well, when the hatchery managers were able to work with scientists, they were actually able to determine the cause of the die-off, which was ocean acidification. And that was good. Long story short, they were able to determine that by tweaking the chemistry that came in through their tanks, as you could see here on the right-hand side, they're able to calibrate it so that the oyster larvae and seed could survive. And um, just for context, a little bit of so you can envision what these are. This is obviously a microscopic picture 
of the oyster larvae, and on the left-hand side, that's what they actually look at. They basically look like little pieces of um, specks of dirt, but that's in fact millions of oyster larvae. And so even though the hatchery managers were able to um, alter their ocean intake water and the chemistry and thus protect the very valuable Pacific Northwest oyster um, industry, there are wild, wild oysters all over the country and these are not protected by hatcheries who cannot, they can't tweak their own chemistry, they're at the whims of the ocean. Um, and in nature they provide, they form these oyster reefs as you can see in the photo on the left that provides habitat for fish and crustaceans and they form shoreline protection for, um, uh, against erosion and storms and they also filter out nutrient runoff and prevent harmful algal blooms. So they're really important and that's why we want to make sure that these oysters are able to survive in the, in the wild, but also because they are an industry that people grow and sell and they're really good to eat. <laughs> Another industry that we talk about quite a bit to lawmakers, particularly those on the West Coast, is the Dungeness crab fishery. Uh, essentially, it's the same story with oysters. Their larvae have been found to be very vulnerable to ocean acidification, this changing ocean chemistry. Um, they die at higher rates when at these, um, essentially when the pH is lower, as I said, it's a, it's a scale, so when the water is a little bit more acidic, they're not used to that. And we tell the stories of California um, Dungeness crabbers. We talk about how much these, um, this industry is worth to lawmakers. But then we also talk about the ocean organisms that are not commercially viable. We don't go to the store and buy them. Um, Anon uh, had a picture of these pteropods earlier. This is uh, just a sort of a, uh, almost like a time-lapse view of what pteropod shells look like when they're grown in ocean acidification conditions for long periods of time. And as similarly to oyster larvae, they do not do well with the shells. And they're a very key component to food chains, so even though we can't go or there's no market to go buy them, they are food for important commercial species such as salmon, which a lot of people really like to eat. Um, in the North Pacific, in, off the coast of, of North America, these sea snails are floating around and they have been susceptible, they are susceptible to this change in ocean chemistry, um, this rise in ocean acidity, which is, it's been about 30 to 40% of an increase since the Industrial Revolution, and without a change in current rates of, um, or current projected rates of CO2 emissions, that's expected to increase by 100 to 150%. So another tactic that we use when we talk to lawmakers is not only the numbers, uh, the jobs on the line, the value of the industries, but also who's impacted, the faces of ocean acidification. Lawmakers, obviously, they have their constituents that they're looking out for, those are their voice, voters. And so we like to point out who those voters are. So going from left to right, those include Native American, um, Native Americans on the left-hand side from Washington State to California oyster workers to Rhode Island, seafood restaurateurs and waiters and waitresses and Virginia oyster growers as well. And I was very happy to hear Dr. Michael Mann talk about Ken Cuccinelli starting an oyster farm in the Chesapeake Bay. We have not been able to talk to him about ocean acidification yet, but dang it, we, we were really going to try to sell him on the fact that his next business is on the line because of this environmental problem. We also talk about not only the, we talk about also the um, people who are sort of on the secondary line of ocean acidification. There are industries that rely on healthy ecosystems and corals to do their business. And this is obviously the tourism and recreation industries uh, from coral reef diving um, in Hawaii is pictured on the left to deep sea fishing in Florida pictured on the right. A lot of fisheries in the southeast rely on these deep water corals on which Many fish find habitat, and so without the corals, who knows where the fish would be? Um, and so we bring this up when we talk to lawmakers. Um, Representative Carlos Carbello's staffer was in a previous session just before this one, and we talked to him and his boss about the impacts to coral reefs around Florida Keys. 
Um, I know that I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about how this is a global issue. Even though you folks are going to be speaking to US representatives tomorrow, there are certainly other countries who stand to lose a lot more than we do from ocean acidification. Obviously, um, they have fishing industries and tourism industries that are arguably much more dependent on the ocean than that of the United States. But then you, one must also consider that now, worldwide, uh, one out of every seven person, seven people gets over 50% of their protein from the ocean. And so this is a food security issue as well. So just to wrap up a little bit, I've talked about the people who are impacted by ocean acidification, the numbers, um, and all, that's all good. We, we use that when we talk to lawmakers. And so cutting CO2 emissions is great. That is the first thing that we would like to do. And so thank you for doing what you do and talking to your representatives tomorrow. I also encourage you to learn more about acidification. As I, as I said, we like to tell the stories of people in these districts who are impacted by acidification. So when you can connect what's a cut in CO2 going to actually do for the voters, that speaks volumes to the lawmakers. And then finally, another fun you know, action that I like to recommend people do is to go eat US farmed shellfish. The oyster farmers, mussel farmers, they're some of the best champions for ocean acidification and doing something about it that we have. They themselves come to DC every year and lobby their own mem members of Congress to act. And so by buying their product, you indirectly support this um, cut in CO2 and just learning more about acidification and getting, again, on the radar of these lawmakers. So uh, thank you so much. This is me eating an oyster. I hope that you folks will be able to do so well um, and do it soon, hopefully. And I guess we will I will take your questions when and just I guess right now. <laughs> Should we go? Thank you so much, Ryan, and all of the speakers. So if you guys could come up and let's get this uh, microphone and get your questions ready and you can hand them to our helpers here. Can you figure out the switch? All right, first question is for Ingrid. How pervasive is air gun blasting in other oceans and what is the fishing industry's uh, response to it? Thank you for this question. Um, seismic air gun blasting is happening all around the world. It's um, right now the Gulf of Mexico is it's happening all the time there. It's been happening for decades. Um, some of the hotspots are Gulf of Mexico, um, the northwestern coast of Australia, the west coast of Africa, um, Europe, especially some of the northern countries, um, also Scandinavia, and Russia. And the fishing community is extremely concerned about seismic air gun blasting. Um, both the South and Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Councils here in the US have sent letters to President Obama and have policies that formally um, oppose seismic air gun blasting because they're worried about impacts to fish. Another question is, uh, do the consequences of ocean acidification include failure of coral reef and, reef and shellfish fisheries and human food supply reduction? So maybe Ryan. Okay. So thank you for that question. I'll take it in two parts. One starting with corals and then the second part with shellfish. Uh, first, with, with corals, unfortunately, they are under a lot of stress from a number of different angles. First, mainly from, I would argue, coral bleaching, first of all, and that's what, you know, is, that is actually caused by a rise in ocean temperatures. That is obviously um, a symptom of the carbon dioxide emissions that are in the atmosphere. And then, unfortunately, ocean acidification sort of piles onto that to make the situation even worse by um, 
hindering their ability to grow, to regrow their skeletons and to be able to recover from coral bleaching. And so it's likely that any sort of rebound from corals is just hindered because of acidification. Dealing with shellfish fisheries, um, you know, it's not extremely well documented in terms of the wild shellfish populations. We really can only begin to start quantifying things from the commercial industry aspect because, as I mentioned before, the conditions are controlled through the hatcheries, then the farmers buy their seed from those hatcheries, and so we could then quantify about how much has been lost. But some of the figures that we've used in, is that between 2006 and 2009, the Pacific Northwest shellfish industry lost about up to 80% of their crop um, in multiple years. And so that's obviously going to be a bad hit for whatever industry, uh, for any industry. As far as a, a food um, human supply reduction question is concerned, there are still a lot of other countries that have large shellfish industries, but we don't yet know how bad their um, losses are, are due to ocean acidification. Um, it's still an emerging topic for the global community. Uh, like it or not, the U.S. is a little, is kind of like ground zero for ocean acidification with regards to shellfish fisheries. It's, as I mentioned before, Pacific Northwest is sort of where it's at. Some of the best scientists are there as well studying this issue, and so I guess that's a positive. Um, but it doesn't exactly um, bode well for future food supplies and further down the food chain as well, or maybe food further up, I should say, to some of the commercial fisheries that um, are a little bit more familiar to people in the West and for just people in general. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, next question, probably for Anand. What is the rate limiting uh, step in the conversion, or what is the rate limiting, what is rate limiting in the conversion of CO2 to carbonate? So I think the, 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 the question can be answered in two ways. I think the, what the questioner is probably getting at is what's the rate limiting step for getting CO2 out of a form that is active in the atmosphere to one that is more passive. So the, that step is the delivery of high CO2 waters to the sediments and the d dissolution of the sediments, which is a relatively slow process. Right? Um, that's the 10,000 year time scale, um, which is the time scale on which we are removing CO2 from the system as a whole. So if you generally look at what happens when you put CO2 in the atmosphere, it goes up, and then it starts to level off. CO2 in the ocean, uh, the total carbon in the ocean continues to rise after that, as carbonate is dissolved from the ocean. That process draws down the CO2 in the atmosphere, and then there's this long tail, which is about 10,000 years. Um, so about, I'd say 60% of the, the CO2 is drawn down relatively rapidly, and then there's a very long tail, where 10 to 20%, so 15% stays in the atmosphere after about 1,000 years. Then there's this long tail where it gets drawn down. Um, for the, that long tail, the removal is the redeposition of that into the ocean sediments, which takes a long time indeed. Thank you, Anand. Yeah, and also on that note, there was a, um, a recent story in the New York Times about how they're working on carbon sequestration in uh, Iceland, where they're basically trying to accelerate that process and uh, you know, artificially convert that uh, carbon dioxide from the air or, or emissions into, uh, into rock. Yeah, and, and again, putting a price on carbon helps that happen, right? Because um, if you put a price on carbon of twenty, thirty dollars per ton CO2, you start making some of these things possible. We could, in fact, deal with the CO2 problem by weathering carbonate rock into the oceans. This has been proposed. The problem is it's fairly expensive. Um, but it's in that fifty to hundred dollar per ton CO2 range. The problem with doing it in just weathering rock in general is that it takes a lot of rock because we're putting a lot, we have to it takes eight times as much rock by weight as it does carbon. So that's a lot. 
Thank you. Uh, next question. If you have a question, you got a or a follow up for that. question was at $30 a ton, how many tons do we need? And basically we're talking about um, somewhere in the range of, okay, so $30 a ton CO2 is about $100. We're talking about needing 20, 15 to 20 billion tons a year. It's a lot of money, right? You're talking about half a trillion dollars a year. That's, that's how much it would take to solve the carbon dioxide problem without going the alternative energy route. Yeah. All right, here's a question from a CCL standpoint. So our CCL chapter is trying to line up a scientist or a college professor to pen an op-ed on ocean acidification in our regional newspaper in Vir uh, Richmond, Virginia. Any ideas? Smiley face. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I can certainly do it, uh, Dick Zimmerman at uh, Old Dominion University would be a good person. There's some, there's some people who do carbon chemistry um, who are more local, um, who, who uh, might have a bigger impact, but come talk to me afterwards. Uh, this question is, uh, are permits from the air gun uh, studies used to reimburse commercial fisheries and other scientific studies? Or what are the permits uh, used for, or the permitting revenues used for? Um, right now, actually, the permits themselves just allow the seismic companies to go out and conduct the air gun blasting. There's no... So one of the points that Shanna makes, so it's, it's good you identified it, is that there's no revenue sharing right now. So the states don't get money, the federal government doesn't get money from these companies going out and doing the seismic air gun blasting. There's no um, state or federal money gained from this. It's the seismic companies get the data, um, they hurt the public resource, and then they sell it for their own benefit. Uh, so, um, question here is, one of the things my family likes to do is walking in tide pools and finding shells. Uh, we haven't been to the coast in, uh, in many years. Are shells found on beaches uh, reason, uh, reasonably deformed, or is there any notice of shells that you would see on the beach? Maybe Ryan? So, I, I'm not... I wouldn't like to hazard to, to guess what every shell it would look like on the beach, but at the same time, most of the impacts we see from ocean acidification are um, most dire at the larval stage, so when they're babies, it kind of makes sense. Human babies, animal babies, they're very vulnerable when they're very young. When they tend to grow to be adults, acidification is not usually one of the factors that cause mortality. They're usually over that hump of vulnerability, and then it's something else that's gotten them. And even for corals, they're mostly been, they've mostly been already weakened by warming, and the acidification process simply prevents them from growing their skeletons back, so you won't see a deformation um, when that happens. Now, I should have mentioned before that I'm actually not a scientist. I get to play one every now and then. Um, but I, from my understanding, that's the case for, for shelled or bivalve organisms. Yeah, and this isn't my primary area of expertise either, but um, the, one of the, tr the things that makes dealing with the oceans tricky in general is that it's very difficult to get long time series of what's going on, right? So as Ryan says, what you might see is that the shell mix has changed. And then the question is, is that ocean acidification? Is it nutrient runoff? Is it fishing? Is it one of the many activities that go on that change the ocean ecosystem at the order zero level? And that, that's one of the challenges that we face in, in ocean policy in general is, it's not one thing. Uh, final question is, uh, I guess for the advocacy organizations, how do you guys see your role interacting with, um, with CCL and its members? And what can, what can CCL members do to bring up ocean, 
ocean issues with their with their representatives and what's how can we make this an issue for uh, for the forty percent of Americans that live uh, near the coast? Well, um, first I thank CCL for inviting us today to just vocalize some of the things we're working on, so you can be more aware of them. Um, we encourage um, everybody, everybody um, who cares about the oceans and wants to protect them to let their local, so their state representatives know about issues they're concerned about. So for us at Oceana, that'd be seismic air gun blessing offshore drilling. So let your state representatives know. Also let the White House know. So send letters, call, email. Um, they do listen to what you're saying and they will make decisions based on your voice. So to add on to that, uh, a couple things come to mind, um, one of which is just simply to, again, learn more about ocean acidification, be able to talk to your rep representatives about the issue, and um, for those who are living inland, I would encourage you, come talk to me afterwards. There's a great um, climate change video that Ocean Conservancy helped support with funding detailing the impact of acidification on fish stocks who migrate inland to you know, Idaho, Montana, those populations of anadrous fishes that live their lives both in freshwater but also in oceanic seawater and they're affected by this ocean change. Um, so anyways, thank you so much and that's um, I think what I would add from our part. All right, let's thank our speakers. And there were a couple questions uh, remaining, and so if you, if you want to come up and talk with them afterwards, uh, feel free. Thank you, everyone.